You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Unfolding tragedy, outlaw country, and class action corn. Plus this day in history with the bikini and our song of the day by Gorillas on your morning monarchy for July 5th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome back to another listener-supported blast of independent, non-commercial, alternative media. Coming to you, as always, from the peak Portland studios up here in Portland, Oregon. Hope you're doing well, safe and sound wherever you are. If you had a nice holiday... Hope you had a good, safe time. We took Monday and Tuesday off. No, you did not miss Media Monarchy broadcasts. We need a little holidays, too. Even independent, non-commercial, alternative media needs to take a little bit of time off. Now, a huge thanks to all of our latest supporters and donors, and I'll hop into that a little bit later in the show. Let's just dive right into it. We got a lot of news to talk about today. Since I took Monday and Tuesday off, we're going to shoehorn in our Monday world news, which we call geopolitics, and our Tuesday tech news, which we call cyberspace war. We're, we're going to cram that in here to the pie that we call your food world order. That's what we typically talk about here on your Wednesday edition of your Morning Monarchy. And we will talk about food, health, and environment news. We got a little bit of class action corn and, of course, a little bit of outlaw country, which is not going to be as much fun as it sounds. Even if you don't like country, this outlaw country I've got is going to be worse than what you think. Glancing at the lamestream news at the G20 Summit, the Washington Compost, the Amazon Post, says it's more and more like Trump against the world. North Korea launching missiles. I believe the UN is heading into the situation as they've launched ICBMs. And the meme wars just don't really stop. And we've seen the memes that say, well, what were you doing during the meme wars? I I was was creating memes. Reddit user behind Trump's CNN meme has apologized, but hashtag CNN blackmail is the story taking hold. Losing the meme wars, the Clinton News Network is. New York cop assassinated in the Bronx while sitting in marked police car, congressman criticized for making video at Auschwitz gas chamber, and North Carolina cops respond to slip and slide complaint end up joining in. Cops on your social media. Nothing says fun like your cops on your Facebook, Fedbook, friend face. Yucksters. So let's dive into our hashtag geopolitics news. All the stories we're about to talk about They've been tweeted out ahead of time. You can find them on the Twitter moment. You can find those at the top of the tweets. And you can, of course, also find the links to the chat. We are hanging out and chatting in Discord. A huge thanks to everybody in there. That's Apollo. That's Crimson Miss. That's Swagger Prance. That Gorilla. Chef Jake. And many, many more awesome people with funny names. We are glad you're here. Microsoft founder Bill Gates has warned that Africa's population explosion will overwhelm Europe unless the continent makes it more difficult for migrants to reach its shores. We are grabbing this from the hated Breitbart. Mom, that's a Breitbart story! (laughs) I was told someone whined out very recently. (laughs) The American billionaire's comments, and they are actually linked from German newspapers. So we're getting a little bit of this translation from Breitbart. I actually posted the whole thing into just the translation bot. And it basically all works out. Of course, it's, it you know comes across a little broken at times. So we'll just grab this from Breitbart. But again, everything we say in play, always included in the show notes. You can just grab that link, throw it in the translate, and you can get the actual translation of all this. And I don't think there's anything they're really hiding. The American billionaire's comments come as European leaders discuss what to do about the surging number of Africans arriving in Italy each week, with Rome calling for other European Union nations to open their ports to docking migrants so as to ease the pressure on the Mediterranean nation. In an interview with the German Welt am Sonntag newspaper, Bill Gates said massive population growth in Africa will result in, quote, enormous migratory pressure on Europe unless countries increase overseas deployment aid payments. Mo money. Praising Germany, having achieved its commitment to devote 0.7% of its GDP to foreign aid is phenomenal. The 61-year-old called on other European nations to follow its example. But Gates also spoke of a dilemma caused by the German attitude towards refugees. Referring to Chancellor Angela Merkel's decision to open Europe's borders to illegal migrants arriving from the third world. Quote, on the one hand, you want to demonstrate generosity and take in refugees. But the more generous you are, the more word gets around about this, which in turn motivates more people to leave Africa. Germany cannot possibly take in a huge, massive number of people who are wanting to make their way to Europe. Because of this, Bill Gates stressed that Europe must make it more difficult for Africans to reach the continent via the current transit routes. Italy is demanding that other EU nations open their ports to migrants ferried from Libya, of course the failed state, brought down by the Clinton Crime Network and others, of course fronted by the man commonly referred to as Barack Obama. 
Italy is demanding that other EU nations open their ports to migrants freed from Libya as the country struggles to cope with having received already over 80,000 people this year. Calling for African newcomers to be spread throughout Europe, the Mediterranean nation's globalist center-left government insisted that the EU migrant relocation program, ooh, that's a mouthful, which was largely limited to people from er Eritrea and Syria, should be expanded to include other nationalities such as Nigerians. UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, on Saturday decried an unfolding tragedy in Italy. Quote, without swift collective action, we can only expect more tragedies at sea, he declared, noting that around 2,000 migrants have lost their lives on the sea route from Libya to Italy this year. The Italian diplomat repeated calls for urgent distribution system for um, incoming migrants and asylum seekers and additional legal pathways to admission. Now, there are thousands and thousands of comments here. But the one right at the top said, I never thought I'd see the day that a multi-billionaire globalist would speak out against immigration. I must look out of the window to see if there are any pigs flying past. Now we just need to hear these same words from Branson, Rowling, and the other various assorted gits in our country. But didn't these billionaires push governments to get them to allow more immigrants? Something's odd here. Something is indeed odd when you see Bill Gates speaking out this way. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy, and that's how we get it rolling. Bill Gates says Europe will be overwhelmed unless it stems the flow of migrants. And that's how we begin our post-4th of July episode of Your Morning Monarchy. Now, we've been playing some of the Corbett Report episodes, and again, we've had a live stream going for the last month plus now. Almost two months. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. We are streaming live Monday through Friday where there aren't holidays. Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. You can hit that link. It should open in your iTunes, your VLC. It should play in your browsers. Hell, it'll play in your Winamp, in your Windows Media Player, old school style. So on our broadcasts, we've also been playing some of the latest Corporate Report broadcasts. Not the least of which, of course, New World Next Week. But I believe it's on the latest Questions for Corbett. They're talking about the new director of the FBI. His name is Christopher Ray, W R A Y. Now, I've got a post here from AllGov, who we've followed for quite some time, and we've even interviewed their head editor, David Wallachinsky, many years ago. That's in the Media Monarchy archives. They run a pretty helpful series. Who is so and so? They basically go through tons and tons of cabinet level positions and just say, who this person is, and they give a pretty much official story kind of rundown. So let's just get the official story rundown. Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who is Christopher Ray? a month after Trump fired Comey and admitted it was because of Comey's role in fostering the investigation into alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and Russian operatives attempting to throw the presidential election to Trump. The president has announced via Twitter on June 7th that he would nominate Christopher Ray to the job. Ray, who served in high positions at the Department of Justice between 2001 and 2005, recently represented, represented New Jersey Governor Chris Christie during the 2016 Bridgegate trial. And yes, we did see the memes over the weekend of Chris Christie chilling on the beach, which he closed. You're not allowed, but he is. That's the powers that shouldn't be in action right there and all their fat, slovenly glory. Two of the governor's top aides were convicted of plotting to close lanes on the George Washington Bridge in order to retaliate against a Democratic mayor who refused to endorse Christie's re-election bid. Attorneys for the aides tried to track down Christie's personal cell phone, but no one seemed to know where it was. As soon as a judge ruled that the phone could not be subpoenaed by the defense attorneys, it was revealed that it was Ray who had possession of the phone all along. Although the trial ended in November, Christopher Ray continued to represent Christie well into June 2017. His law firm has collected more than $2 million in fees for the case. Christopher Asher Ray was born December 17, 1966 in New York City, even though they try and act like he's from Georgia. Born in New York City to Cecil Ray Jr., a partner at the Debevoise and Plimpton Law Firm and Gilda Gates Ray, a program officer for the Charles Hayden Foundation. So he comes from law and foundations. He attended the Tony Private Boarding School Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. He earned a BA at Yale in 1989 and a law degree in 92, also at Yale, where he served as executive editor of the Yale Law Journal. After graduating, he served as a law clerk to Judge J. Michael Ludig, 
of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit from June 92 to June 93. Entering private practice after a summer hiatus, Ray was an associate at the law firm of blah 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 bling bling bloom It goes through all his little early gigs. But the important parts. Ray served from 2003 to 2005 as the assistant attorney general in charge of the Department of Justice's so-called criminal division, working under Deputy Attorney General James Comey. His responsibilities included briefing Attorney General John Ashcroft. Remember that name? Remember the guy who had to put drapes over the naked Statue of Liberty because he couldn't stay in the sight of some stone titties? Literally covering up the statues of justice. His responsibilities include briefing John Ashcroft about the investigation into George W. Bush administration's leaking of Valerie Plame's status as a CIA agent. In 2004, Ray was one of the DOJ officials, including Comey and Robert Mueller, who threatened to resign when the Bush administration attempted to revive a National Security Agency domestic surveillance program that the DOJ had determined was illegal. Please don't throw us into the briar patch. We're acting like we're against this. So this piece from AllGov is pretty whitewashy, but it just has the actual bits. It's got the bits, it's got the parts. Let's add in an extra one as well from Zero Hedge, which gets into a lot of the extra law bits. And I suppose one of the main things that we want to point out, the two points that we want to point out, I suppose. He was a major part of the Department of Justice's response to the 9-11 attacks, and he also oversaw the Enron Task Force. Christopher Ray, as dirty as they come, and this is generally the way these things go. People you've maybe not heard of before, or at least names that weren't a part of the daily lexicon of two minutes hate. You start to hear about them and you look into their background and you say, oh, you've been training for this for a long, long time. You've been prepped for this for a long, long time. Enron, Plamegate, 9-11. That's even just the tip of the iceberg. But the question that we have to leave somewhat unanswered, unfortunately, is that we don't exactly know the answer as to whether or not Christopher Ray is a member of Skull and Bones. Now, I'm sure as we are just getting rolling on having these powers that shouldn't be, we might find out as the weeks and months and possibly years go by with Christopher Ray as the new head of the FBI, following in, of course, the fine footsteps of amazing people like J. Edgar Hoover. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy, and we're getting our geopolitics updates. And someone we mention often, and I think in a lot of ways kind of floats around as a specter of a lot of the bad decisions that we've seen over these past 16 years, Trump has appointed himself Chicago police chief as the feds get involved in the crime land known as Chicago land. When you talk about Chicago, Chicago's been in the news. Uh, the biggest thing in the news is they're totally bankrupt. <laughs> and maybe, they're, maybe they uh, can't pay their police or something. But what we want to talk about is uh, the law and order in Chicago. But uh, it looks like the feds are coming to the rescue. Uh, you know, there's a strike force set up. Matter of fact, interesting enough, the strike force that's going to be much more involved in Chicago enforcing law was an idea of Obama. So uh, we can argue this is bipartisan and everybody wants us to be bipartisan. So this is a strike force. But, uh, of course, I find it uh, a little bit threatening uh, because they don't deal with why is there such a mess and why are there some why is there so much crime there is it whose jurisdiction in this uh, uh in in this uh, pro, in, for this problem and of course the founders were pretty explicit that uh you, you know policing activity was not the role of a federal police force so there's a lot of questions that are raised here and then the question the, the big thing is is will a fed the feds getting involved all of a sudden reduce the amount of crime there or in a way if if you're very strict uh, and inclusive in committing crimes, could they actually end up increasing the crime rate if you add all the infractions our governments get involved in, you know, such as surveillance and taking guns from innocent people, those kind of things. So the, uh, the real law enforcement problem just may well get worse. And I don't see the solution just by having a federal police activity and a strike force to march in to take over for the police department. President Trump has made good on his promise to send in more federal agents to crime-plagued Chicago. For now, he's sending in a new task force. 
to track down illegal guns? Will he send in more? Will more armed federal agents solve Chicago's problems? Those questions and more addressed by Dr. Ron Paul on the Ron Paul Liberty Report. That is a whole 20-minute broadcast. Of course, everything we say and play always included in the show notes, so you can go get these links and you can watch the rest of the videos and read the rest of the articles and continue the research yourself. We are just getting rolling on this morning, Monarchy, for July 5th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Glad you're here. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, streaming live. French oil and gas company Total SA has agreed to a $4.8 billion deal with Iran to develop one of the world's largest, largest natural gas fields. This coming from the AFP with the extra edition of two times largest, thanks to RT. I love catching the typos. The country's oil ministry announced the deal on Sunday. It is Iran's first investment by an international energy company since sanctions were eased last year after reaching an international agreement to slow the development of its nuclear program, so says Bloomberg. The contract is to develop part of the South Pars gas field in the Persian Gulf. Iran's petroleum minister, Bijan Zanganeh, said last month that the deal was in its final stages and would be signed within the coming weeks, Press TV reported. Total Chief Executive Patrick Puyan has previously said it was worth the company taking the billion-dollar risk of future sanction restrictions being imposed because the deal opens a huge market. Washington has warned that it would cancel the sanctions, the sanction waivers, rather, if Tehran didn't amend its nuclear program to the limit set out in the international deal. We are perfectly conscious of some risks. We've taken into account sanction snapbacks. We have taken into account regulation changes. We have to live with some uncertainty, Puyan told Reuters. Total is heading an international consortium with Chinese company CNPCI to develop the gas field. The deal was signed Monday, according to a ministry spokesperson talking again to the AFP. So that's Total. Huge French oil company signing a huge $4.8 billion gas deal with Iran. And I suppose that energy story transitions us into our cyberspace war news. So we took Monday and Tuesday off, so we're cramming Monday and Tuesday's news into your Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy. And we'll get to the food, health, and environment news coming up in just a little bit, but we'll get into hashtag cyberspace war. And again, all the stories that we talk about on these shows are just the handful of picked stories that we've chosen to discuss. We are not only crowdfunded, but we are crowdsourced. You can find tons of news using those hashtags. I make the challenge that if you just use the Media Monarchy hashtags, you'd be pretty damn well informed week to week. So let's head on over to Japan. As I always remember the Beastie Boys saying, I love Japan because they have the oldest ancient things we never had and they've got the most high-tech things we don't have yet. The Justice Ministry of Japan announced yesterday a plan to introduce a new type of unmanned gate at major airports to fast-track Japanese passengers while allowing more officials to screen foreign nationals as a measure to counter terrorism and block illegal entry. The headline of this article, Ministry unveils plan for facial recognition to speed up airport entry exit process. By smoothing out the immigration entry and exit process, process is, for Japanese people, we can have more immigration officials run investigations on foreign nationals, said a news release distributed by the ministry on Tuesday, with 40 million travelers from overseas expected to come into Japan in 2020. This is all Olympics bullshit hype here. And 60 million expected in 2030. Of course, 2030 tied into not only America's, but also Saudi Arabia's Agenda 2030 that's getting so much ink. It's easy to predict that airports will be short on immigration staff, Justice Ministry official said. The new gates. And isn't this interesting? We were talking just, just at the top of the show about Bill Gates and migrants. Now we're talking about airplane gates and biometrics. The new gates will feature cameras that take photographs of passengers. By using facial recognition technology, they will match the photo with image data retrieved from passports. The whole process will take less than 15 seconds. The ministry introduced similar unmanned gates that use fingerprint authentication in 2007, but less than 10% of passengers used them in 2016. It's possible the gates were unpopular because they required users to register their fingerprints before their flights. The new gates will not require such advanced registration. They'll just snap your picture and put it in the database. You don't have to do it ahead of time. They've made this easier for you. Now shut up, slave, and get in line. 
And don't make a sad face because our behavior detection officers, who are poorly trained, will throw you in the airport jail. Three units of this type are scheduled to be installed at Haneda Airport in Tokyo as early as this October to be used by Japanese passengers on arrival. The gates are scheduled to be introduced at three other international airports, Narita, Chuba, and Kansai, by the end of 2018. To be able to install the new gates... Article 54 of the Ordinance for Enforcement of the Immigration Control and Refugee Recognition Act. Oh, and it must be amended to allow machines to store disembarkation records on passports rather than the data being recorded by immigration officials manually applying a stamp like a caveman. The amended law is scheduled to be enforced from mid-October, according to the official. The ministry is accepting public comments on the amendment until August 3rd. Of course, anyone who files a public comment will immediately be put on a database. <laughs> For foreign nationals who come to Japan on business, automated gates have been available at major airports since last November. However, an applicant must meet certain requirements to register as a trusted traveler including being employed full-time at a public or private organization for a year and having visited Japan at least twice within the 12-month period prior to arrival. Trusted Travelers We've got those trusted travelers here in the States. That's what lets you bypass all the cattle lined up in the herd. And that's okay because some are more equal than others. And you, as a slightly more equal bit of cattle, you've already given them all of your information. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. Glad you're here. We're doing our Tech Tuesday news. And now it's time for a little outlaw country. Which reminds me, actually, we were able to go to a swimming pool couple days ago which was very 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 nice we've got a friend who is a member at an elks lodge here so we were actually able to go to an elks lodge here just outside of portland and have a good time doing a little bit of swimming and the lifeguard was also the bartender they had basically a little cooler by the pool that you could go buy some snacks and buy some drinks two dollar wine two dollar cores woohoo and they had country playing on the radio kind of felt good it kind of felt like old times kind of felt like west virginia so cassie and i had a good time doing that this is not that kind of outlaw country and i would pick that kind of outlaw country over this kind of outlaw country any goddamn day of the week wikileaks has published leaked documents purportedly from outlaw country an alleged cia program designed to overcome and alter firewalls on a linux operating device So now, criminals in action coming after Linux. An apparent user guide bearing the symbol of the CIA was published on the WikiLeaks site last Thursday. Outlaw Country allows for the redirection of all outbound network traffic on a target computer to CIA-controlled machines for X and infiltration purposes. A type of malware, the virus targets a very specific version of the Linux operating system. The target must be running a compatible 64-bit version of CentOS... Real 6.x, that's kernel version 2.6.32. And it's got all the books, it's got all the covers. Engineering Development Group, Outlaw Country, V1.0 User Manual. Revision A, June 4th, 2015. The reasons for installing the bug are not explained in the Outlaw Country Engineering Guide, other than it gives users the opportunity to alter a computer's security settings. Outlaw Country is made up of a file that creates a hidden net filter table or a new set of firewall settings. With knowledge of the table name, an operator can create rules that take precedence over existing net filter IP tables rules. All evidence of the virus is destroyed when the net filter table is removed by the operator. Red Hat, a provider of Linux open source software, told RT that its security team has crafted a knowledge base article about Outlaw Country. The article explains that this is not a vulnerability in any Red Hat product. The manual outlines the details of a tool that can be used once an attacker already has local and root access to a system. The article, which appears on the Red Hat website, advises people using a Linux system that has been targeted by the exploit to upgrade to a newer version. Now, notes on that newer version, we can glance over at the chat right now and see that our buddy DJ Sumdog notes that that is ancient. Kernel 2.6, Jesus, that's old. If you're running that, you need to get out of technical debt. So you need upgrade. Upgrade gonna kill me. CIA hacking tool targets Linux operating system. And again, you can get the full book. You can get the full rundown from WikiLeaks. And that's a little 4th of July story for you. Little little outlaw country. Now one story 
about the criminals in action. The Cocaine Importation Agency deserves another. WikiLeaks Vault 7 has provided insight into the CIA's hacking capabilities. So far, we've learned that they can hack into various electronic devices like smartphones, TVs, and computers. Some of the CIA's tech revealed by Vault 7 is, as we've even just noted, outdated and overhyped. But the latest revelation, called Project ELSA, seems frightening. E-L-S-A. I think Elsa is a Nazi she-wolf in uh, exploitation films, but Elsa is also the code name for the CIA's geolocation malware for Wi-Fi-enabled devices like laptops running Windows. One of the scariest things about Elsa WikiLeaks notes is that once CIA malware is installed on a target system, it doesn't even need to be connected to the internets to function. Quote, once persistently installed on a target machine using separate CIA exploits, the malware scans visible Wi-Fi access points and records the ESS identifier, MAC address, and signal strength at regular intervals. To perform the data collection, the target machine does not have to be online or connected to an access point. It only needs to be running with an enabled Wi-Fi device. If the system is connected to the Internet, it then proceeds to log the geolocation of the target using databases from Google or Microsoft. The malware then stores the longitude and latitude data along with a timestamp for when the information was collected in an encrypted location on the user's hard drive. Oh, well, thanks for encrypting it. Further, WikiLeaks has showcased that Elsa doesn't phone home to the CIA. The data has to be extracted by a CIA agent using separate CIA exploits and backdoors or air-gapping it out using a computer's hard drive LED light. That latter part does sound like science fiction, but if the computer was infected with malware, a drone could then exfiltrate the data if the drone were able to get close enough to see the computer's light, this according to Wired. With the revelation of this type of hacking technique, it begs the question, why would this method be used? The answer is almost certainly for targeting hackers and terrorists, such as the CIA's mad experiment in the Middle East, ISIS. With the geo geological location data of a target, it'd make droning a target easy-peasy, lemon squeezy. Kablamo. So that's why they want to listen to your Wi-Fi signals. CIA can geolocate your computer by listening to Wi-Fi signals. That article coming from Activist Post. We'll hop over to a little bit of Verge as police body camera footage is becoming a state secret. Late last month, the old gray lady published a piece headlined Hollywood-style heroism is latest trend in police videos about body camera footage, body camera footage, that depicts police officers as paragons of bravery. I'm sure riding down slip and slides, right? Lording over busts of grams of marijuana. One video from the Hamden Police Department in Connecticut showed a police officer pulling a troubled man away from the edge of a building. Another from the Topeka Police Department in Kansas shows an officer rescuing a drowning boy from a pond. These videos were not released at the request of journalists or civilians hoping to shed light on police activity. They were instead released by police employees as counter-programming. A way to characterize cops positively when tales of bad apples overtook the news cycle. The chief talked to me about how Topeka was really getting beat up in the news with some shootings, some homicides. An officer told the Times, Topeka really needed a good story. North Carolina passed legislation last year excluding body camera video from public record, so footage is not available through... North Carolina's Public Records Act. That means civilians have no right to view police recordings in the Tar Heel State unless their voice or their image was captured in the video. Louisiana also exempts body camera video from public record laws. South Carolina will only release body camera footage to criminal defendants and the subjects of recordings. Do you find any, any, any connecting line between all these states? North Carolina, South Carolina, Louisiana. Southern good old boy boss hog areas. You ain't from around here, is you? Well, they'll all have cameras on, but you won't get to see that footage. Just like all the cameras over in the UK, all that camera. It's not solving crime. It's just creating a good database. It's just creating a good little police state system where people think they're being watched at all times. And in a lot of ways, they are being watched at all times. But again, when something actually goes down and we actually need to look at footage... Hey, where's that footage? Well, you can't see it because they'll either say the cameras weren't working, they were broken, or you have no right to see that footage because we've already written laws saying that that's legal. Let's head on down to the land down under as Australia's military is undergoing a major transformation with the launch of a new information warfare unit. 
The Australian Broadcasting Company has learned the team will launch within days and will be part of Australia's defense operations. I'm sure it'll be very defensive. It'll be tasked with defending Australian military targets from cyber attacks and preparing to launch its own assaults on foreign forces. Professor Greg Austin from the University of New South Wales described it as one of the biggest shits, I mean shifts, in defense strategy. The main angle of cyber war is to prevent the enemy's armed forces from reaching the start line of battle. 100 personnel will be tasked to the unit, growing to 900 within 10 years. So Australia is basically going to have a thousand militaries, soldiers sitting on their ass, giving you propaganda and also hacking other systems. And it gets worse and worse and worse with our hashtag cyberspace war coverage. Over the last couple of weeks, there's been a disturbing trend of governments demanding that private tech companies share their source code if they want to do business. Now, the government is giving the same ultimatum and of course it's getting what it wants. On Sunday, the CEO of security firm Kaspersky Labs, Eugene Kaspersky, told the Associated Press that he's willing to show the U.S. government his company's source code. Anything I can do to prove that we don't behave maliciously, I will do it, Kaspersky said, while insisting that he's open to testifying before Congress as well. He, he'll, he'll strip down naked. He would like to be patted down in the airport. All in the name of freedom. Because, you know, if you didn't do anything wrong, what do you have to hide? The company's willingness to share its source code comes after a proposal was put forth in the Senate that prohibits the Defense Department from using software platforms developed by Kaspersky Lab. It goes on to say, quote, The Secretary of Defense shall ensure that any network connection between the Department of Defense and a department or agency of the United States government that is using or hosting on its networks a software platform associated with Kaspersky Lab is immediately severed. So it does not take a business genius to see... Oh, Uncle Scam ain't going to buy my biz unless I give him the code. The proposal prompted an official response from Russian communications minister Nikolai Nikiforov. He warned that any unilateral political sanctions would prompt retaliation from Russia. He emphasized that his government uses a huge proportion of American software and hardware solutions in the IT sphere, even in very sensitive areas. So, of course, the fight over source code comes at a moment when we're engaged in a new, massive, so-called Cold War. Even Gizmodo says, in a worrisome move, Kaspersky agrees to turn over source code to the U.S. government. Now, that story was tweeted by our buddy James Corbett at CorbettReport.com. We will be taping a new episode of New World Next Week a little bit later this afternoon. If you've got any hashtag New World Next Week stories you want to hear, tweet those out. Hashtag New World Next Week. And as long as we're talking about being crowdsourced with news, I want to mention that we are also crowdfunded. We are brought to you by you. Media Monarchy's been online since 9-11-05. There's 11,000 plus articles, interviews, episodes, and so much more on the website. And again, you keep us going. A huge thanks to our latest patrons at Patreon.com. That's Rachel T., Patrick C., Alyssa M., and Simon T. Huge thanks to all of them. Patreon.com slash Media Monarchy. That gives us the monthly support we need for as little as a dollar a month. I consider you a supporter and subscriber of Media Monarchy. We also got all classic PayPal, paypal.me slash Media Monarchy. And a huge thanks to Gen C, Derek W, Emmanuel A, and Christopher S. They used PayPal as a way to give us that support that we need. And we've also got the snail mail. Huge thanks to Harry Nuts from Radio Confluence. I got a big, big batch of stickers for RadioConfluence.com. You might know them for simulcasting and rebroadcasting all of the Media Monarchy shows. RadioConfluence.com. Huge thanks to Jared and everybody there. I got some postcards from Kate Smith. Not the famed singer, but friend of Media Monarchy supporter Bo. She sent some postcards from Nebraska about the independent communities that are being built in Nebraska. So that's the snail mail. And we've also got Bitcoin as well. And a huge thanks to a very generous donor of Bitcoin. Again, as I always have to say, if you don't tell me who he is with the Bitcoin, I don't know who you are, except your long string of 25 numbers and letters. MediaMonarchy.com slash support has the PayPal, the Patreon, the Bitcoin, the post office box. If you can give a little, I can give a lot, my friends. And a huge thanks to all of you. Big time. Now it is Wednesday. Let's blast through our food, health, and environment news. 
Hashtag food world order. Food world order, a phrase I coined on, on, on the air several years ago. And we begin in the UK. As the National Health Service tainted blood shame, secret files reveal health bosses knew for five years patients were being infected with deadly contaminated samples. Documents reveal patients were given contaminated blood for at least five years. Minutes of meetings held in 1980 and 1981 show the officials put patients at risk. And scientists plan to use the victims as guinea pigs to develop a new hepatitis test. Those are just the takeaways from the article. Patients were given deadly contaminated blood for at least five years after health officials became aware of the danger. Damning documents have revealed newly unearthed minutes of meetings held in 1980 and 1981 show that officials consciously put patients at risk during a scandal which killed 2,000 people. Scientists were show, so sure the blood was dangerous, they even planned to use victims as guinea pigs to develop a new test for hepatitis, say the papers, which are likely to play a central role in a major civil action to be lodged at the High Court today, yesterday, now, in which 300 families of victims are suing the government. The minutes show officials knew at least 50 patients a year were becoming infected with hepatitis. Despite this... The supply of contaminated blood was not stopped until 1986. The contaminated blood scandal of the 70s and 80s centered on the use of clotting agents for patients with hemophilia. They were given a product called Factor 8, which was extracted from donors' bloods. The NHS was low on supplies, so Factor 8, and that's Roman numeral style, Factor V-I-I-I, was imported from the U.S., where it was often taken from high-risk groups, including drug addicts, prostitutes, and prisoners who had donated their blood for cash. An estimated 7,500 people contracted hepatitis as a result, and many were also infected with HIV. Up to 2,000 people died, and others were left with severe health problems. In 1990, the Daily Mail highlighted the plight of hemophiliacs infected campaigning for them to receive compensation. The scandal first came to light in the mid-1980s, when fears over the AIDS epidemic in the U.S. highlighted the dangers of contaminated blood from transfusions. But the new documents, unearthed by the son of one of the victims, reveal scientists were aware of the problem well before this. At an international hematology symposium in Glasgow in September 1980, Experts were already predicting problems would emerge within a decade. Dr. Howard Thomas, a liver expert, told the meeting, quote, It is in 10 years' time we shall see the problems. Bearing in mind the proportion of the patients that are infected or have persistent abnormal liver function tests, anything from 60 to 80 percent, it'll be an enormous problem when it happens. This connects. This is factor eight. This is Bayer. We learned about this story many, many years ago from the Ring of Fire. We learned about this from Mike Papantonio. We learned about this from, was it even RFK Jr.? This is a fundamental bedrock story connecting all of this. Now, I didn't know that this connected actually to Factor 8. Yes, Bayer. B-A-Y-E-R. That is what I said <laughs> in the chat. So I didn't actually know in setting up the story that that is what this is connected to. NHS tainted blood shame, patients infected with deadly samples. And we've played that clip. It's in the archives. Wait, wait, wait. Are you telling me that they knowingly shipped tainted drugs? Yes. Hell, is that even on Scarborough Country? Is that Joe Scarborough clip? Do we have to do this right now? I guess I guess we might, just to just to put this right. As we head on over to YouTube. Factor 8. Tainted. Worst drug scandal. Bayer exposed. It is Scarborough Country. Holy moly. Mike, welcome to the show. We appreciate you being on tonight. Thanks for the invitation, Joe. Okay, let's talk about the rat of the week. Why is Bayer Corporation the rat of the week? Internal documents show that after this company positively, absolutely knew that they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus, they took the product off the market in the U.S. and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. The medicine's called Factor 8. It was an, inject an injection medicine that was used for hemophiliacs, mostly children. Children. Children had been born with an incurable disease. Hold on, hold on, Mike. So hold on, hold on. So you're yeah. telling me that Bear knew that this drug was infected.
infected with the AIDS virus. They yanked it from the market in America, and then they dumped it in markets overseas. They had to figure out a way, Joe, to make a profit on a product that they could not sell in America. There you have it. And we'll include that whole clip. We'll include that whole clip in the show notes. That's why doing this kind of work is important. That's why giving the context is really important. So we've only gotten more documentation now. Tainted drugs from Bayer sent all over the world. Who's Bayer trying to buy out? Who are they trying to merge with? This is your morning monarchy. We're getting over our food world order news right now. Food, health, and environment news. Last couple of headlines. And it's not going to get a whole lot better. I do have one positive note towards the end. Oh, and they're even posting other documentaries in a bit. Factor 8, The Arkansas Prison Blood Scandal, a documentary from 2005 directed by Kelly Duda. Posted in the show notes. Thanks to Keith for that. And that's how we do this. We work together sharing this information. Meanwhile, though, fish are becoming transgender from contraceptive pill chemicals being flushed down household drains. This from The Telegraph. A fifth of male fish are now transgender because of chemicals from the contraceptive pill being flushed down household drains. Male river fish displaying feminized traits and even producing eggs. Some have reduced sperm quality and display less aggressive and competitive behavior, which makes them less likely to breed successfully. The chemicals causing these effects include ingredients in the contraceptive pill, byproducts of cleaning agents, plastics, and cosmetics. All of those things should be thrown from your house into the garbage. Not down the sink. Get rid of them. All that crap. All that cleaning junk. All those things people can't even smell anymore. I've talked about this so many times ever since I quit smoking. Which is uh, the fifth fifth year anniversary coming up in about ten days. I've gotten my sense of smell back. Yeah, we know all the Bill Hicks jokes. But I live in New York. I don't want my sense of smell back, which you can kind of see where he's coming from. No one can even really smell all the chemicals they're covering themselves in. I step outside. People walk by. All the hipster kids here in Portland, they all reek. They're all covered in chemicals, covered in fragrances. All you got to do is look up dryer sheets, lower IQ. And indeed they do. All these things should be removed post-haste from your home. Think about your little kittens. Think about your kids. Think about your wife. Think about your families. A couple more headlines using food, health, and environment news, my friends. Widely used insecticides damage the survival of honeybee colonies. The world's largest ever field trial has shown for the first time, as well as harming wild bees. The farm-based research, along with a second new study, also suggests widespread contamination of entire landscapes and a toxic cocktail effect from multiple pesticides. The landmark work provides the most important evidence yet for regulators around the world considering action against neonicotinoids, neonics, including in the EU, where a total ban is poised to be implemented this autumn. The insecticides are currently banned on flowering crops in the EU. The negative impacts found varied across different countries, leading the pesticide manufacturers to question whether the results of the research, which they funded, were real. The new research is published in the prestigious peer-reviewed journal Science. Pesticides damage survival of bee colonies. The world's largest ever field trial demonstrates widely used insecticides harm both honeybees and wild bees. Damn it. And we paid for that? Womp womp. And we'll end with one last womp womp. Syngenta AG was ordered to pay $217.7 million to a group of Kansas farmers who claimed the company carelessly marketed its genetically modified corn seed, causing contamination of U.S. crops and a rejection of export sales to China by officials there. A Kansas jury issued the verdict Friday in the first trial ever brought by U.S. farmers alleging Syngenta caused five years of depressed corn prices. Several other trials are pending as lawyers pursue suits on behalf of some 350,000 corn growers claiming as much as $13 billion in losses. The win gives momentum to claims by farmers for more than 20 states who are suing the Swiss agrochemical giant. Syngenta faces its next class action in a Minnesota court in August where farmers are seeking more than $600 million and our huge Minnesota contingent of Media Monarchy listeners We'll have to keep us posted on that. We'll have to continue to follow that story when that snaps off and pops off in August. 
Syngenta loses $218 million verdict in the first GMO trial test. Corn producers claimed contaminated crops hurt sales to China. And class action lawsuit involved genetically modified seeds. I guess that's not unmitigated good news. I see you guys still in the chat talking about, of course, all the scents, all the perfumes, all the things in the cabinets of our relatives and, and, and ancestors and grandparents. I know, I know, it's, it sounds crazy. God, I'd, I'd rather just smell the patchouli. We're glad you woke up and smelled the patchouli and joined us here on Your Morning Monarchy. All of those stories you will be able to find in the show notes as we crammed in Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday news all into one mighty Media Monarchy episode. And I'll remind you again, we always tweet out the headlines an hour before showtime. We are going to go out, as we've done several times lately, with brand new music from Gorillaz. I'll tell you a little bit more about the brand new exclusive track coming up in just a few minutes. But of course, let's take a look at this day in history, my friends. Past is prologue, July 5th, 1915. The Liberty Bell leaves Philadelphia by special train on its way to the Panama Pacific International Exposition. This is the last trip outside Philadelphia that the custodians of the bell intend to permit. July 5th, 1934, it's Bloody Thursday as police open fire on striking longshoremen in San Francisco. Cops and their enforcers, Pinkerton Guards. They have a long, illustrious history of killing people who get a little get a little uppity. July 5th, 1937, Spam, the luncheon meat, is introduced into the market by the Hormel Foods Corporation. Who did Hormel buy up recently? Oh yeah, Hormel bought up Applegate. Speaking of hot dogs and 4th of July. <laughs> Bummer. This day in history, July 5th, 1946, French designer Louis Reard unveils a daring two-piece swimsuit at the Piscine Molitor, a popular swimming pool in Paris. Parisian showgirl Micheline Bernardini modeled the new fashion, which Reard had dubbed Bikini, inspired by a news-making U.S. atomic test that took place off the Bikini Atoll in the Pacific Ocean earlier that week. Another French creation, the Bikini named after the atomic explosion in the Pacific. The bikini was an explosion everywhere. Scholars traced the style back 1,500 years, but it was still a revelation. And there, for some reason, is Bob Hope talking about the bikini on old newsreel. You can get that newsreel and check that out, just like we include everything else that we play and say in the show notes. That's this day, July 5th, 1946. The bikini goes on sale after debuting at an outdoor fashion show at the Molitor Pool in Paris, France. July 5th, 1950, filed under Zionism, the Knesset passes the Law of Return on this day in 1950, which grants all Jews the right to immigrate to Israel. July 5th, 1954, the BBC broadcast its first television news bulletin on this day. July 5th, same day, BBC making their first news bulletin broadcast, a little guy named Elvis Aaron Presley made his first commercial recording. And the sessions took place in Memphis, Tennessee. He recorded That's All Right Mama and Blue Moon of Kentucky. Keep on shining. Ten years later, July 5th, 1964, Jerry and the Pacemakers released their single How Do You Do It? And we will play that single for you on vinyl as we kick off your pump up the volume coming up in a couple of hours. That's your daily DJ set. July 5th, 1971, the 26th Amendment to the United States Constitution, lowering the voting age from 21 to 18, is formally certified by everyone's favorite president, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Filed under the right to vote on this day, July 5th, 1971. Lowering the voting age from 21 to 18. But you still can't drink or buy weed. Right? Is it, is it 21 for weed? I don't know. Fortunately, I don't care. July 5th, 1977, military coup in Pakistan. That is Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. You might not recognize those first two names, but that last name we definitely recognize. Bhutto was overthrown. He was the first elected prime minister of Pakistan. Isn't it funny how all those democratically elected leaders get overthrown? 
And then we find out later a little bit more about it. July 5th, 1978, the EMI record pressing plant in Britain stopped printing the Rolling Stones album cover for some girls due to complaints from celebrities. I don't have a lot of Rolling Stones, but that actually is one of the albums I have. July 5th, 1989, Oliver North is sentenced by U.S. District Judge Gerhard A. Gessel to a three-year suspended prison term, two years probation, $150,000 in fines, and 1,200 hours of community service. His convictions are, of course, later overturned. As Fox News and other fake news networks have a retirement program for former government operatives. Oliver North sentenced on this day, 1989, as part of the Iran-Contra affair. July 5th, 1995, and we just discussed a little bit of this, I believe it was only last week, when we talked about Pearl Jam going up against Ticketmaster. Well, about a year and a half after Jeff Ahmed and Stone Gossard testified before Congress, on this day, July 5th, 1995, the U.S. Justice Department decided not to take antitrust action against Ticketmaster. July 5th, 1996, Dolly the Sheep becomes the first mammal cloned from an adult cell. 1999, U.S. President Bill Clinton imposes trade and economic sanctions against the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. July 5th, 1989. 2006, and that's why past this prologue, North Korea tests four short-range missiles, one medium-range and one long-range Type Dong-2. The long-range Type Dong-2 reportedly fails in midair over the Sea of Japan. So 11 years to the day, they're essentially practicing the same things. The powers that shouldn't be, regardless of their stature, they love dates. They love ritual. They love anniversaries. July 5th, 2009, the largest hoard of Anglo-Saxon gold ever discovered in England, consisting of more than 1,500 items, is found near the village of Hammerwich, near Lichfield in Stratfordshire. The largest hoard of Anglo-Saxon gold ever found in England on this day, 2009. And finally, two years ago today, July 5th, 2015, in Chicago, Illinois, the Grateful Dead performed the final show of their Fare Thee Well shows. Except they totally didn't because they went on to tour with John Mayer and did more and more shows and continued to bleed it dry. Watched a little bit of Long Strange Trip, the new documentary up on them, the like eight, nine part series. Pretty interesting. We might have to talk about that on the Deep Focus coming up. Published a media monarchy a decade ago via the Sydney Morning Herald. The government has admitted the need to secure oil supplies is a factor in Australia's continued military involvement in Iraq. Defense Minister Brendan Nelson said that today oil was a factor in Australia's contribution to the unpopular war as energy security instability in the Middle East would be crucial to Australia's future. Published a media monarchy a decade ago today, Australia says oil is behind the Iraq war. It's good always to have a little bit of truth in advertising. Now I know, taking some of those days off, we missed some of the This Day in Histories posted to Media Monarchy. But it's all up there for you. MediaMonarchy.com Celebrating birthdays today, July 5th, ni- oh no, not 1918, 10. P.T. Barnum, American businessman, co-founder of the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, which is essentially out of business. And isn't it P.T. Barnum that was reported to have said there's a sucker born every minute? The other birthday, somebody else who also probably thought a lot of people were suckers. Born on this day in 1853, English, South African businessman and politician and the sixth prime minister of the Cape Colony. Oh, that's right. Cecil Rhodes, born on this day, July 5th, 1853. All right, the birthdays get a little better after those. Warren Oates, famed actor. You might know him from The Wild Bunch. Born on this day. Painter, photographer Chuck Close. The band's Robbie Robertson. Huey Lewis of... Huey Lewis in the news, born on this day, an American guitarist and songwriter by the name of Jimmy Crespo. You might not recognize the name Jimmy Crespo. C-R-E-S-P-O. He replaced Joe Perry on the one, maybe two albums where Joe Perry wasn't in Aerosmith. Those are the pretty lean, fallow years of the mid-80s of Aerosmith. So while Astro over in the chat is admitting they like The Grateful Dead, I'll I'll admit I like Aerosmith. Got some pretty classic Aerosmith t-shirts. 
It's also Bill Watterson's birthday, and that's of Calvin and Hobbes fame. Mark Cohn, he of the Best New Artist Grammy. Edie Falco's birthday, and it's Nardwar. Thanks to Corbett for turning me on to Nardwar. N A R D W U A R. He's a strange interviewer out of Canada talking to bands when they come through town. Really interesting, really funny. Check up Nardwar. It's also the Riz's birthday and Weed's creator, Gingy Cohen. All those folks celebrating birthdays today. I don't think any of them will make it into our daily DJ set at noon. I won't play any of that bad 1985 Done With Mirrors era, Aerosmith. <laughs> we'll play tons of new music for you. And as we noted, we'll kick off with a little bit of Jerry and the Pacemakers. However, we'll wrap up this morning monarchy with another new track from Gorillaz. So their latest album, Humans, I'm admittedly not a big fan of i keep trying to give it some chances and it's just too rappy too angry i'm not really feeling it and generally what i want out of gorillas is way more damon albarn not a million hip-hop guests so fortunately this new non-humans track humans being the name of the latest gorillas album we got a non-album track and it features pretty much nothing but damon albarn yeah i'm not a fan but here's another song See, I'm trying. I'm 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 trying to. I don't want to just need your go. That sucks. Art sometimes takes a little bit of time to get into. And again, and again, remember, art greater than artist. But what I'm saying is I'm in it for the Damon Albarn. This track, Sleeping Powder, a new non-humans album track, features pretty much nothing but Damon Albarn. So we'll go out with Gorilla's Sleeping Powder. As we try and brush the sleeping powder out of our eyes and out of our friends and family and our loved ones. As we try and learn our way forwards, my friend. That is the super packed geopolitics, cyberspace war, food world order edition of your morning monarchy. And I'm so glad you're here. We are streaming live Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. And we are brought to you by you. Boom, there it is. Wednesday, July 5th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com again, thanking you so much for listening and reminding you, as always, like Jella Offer said, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.